Hello everyone and welcome to this session in which we'll be exploring sexualities, genders and identities and I've put safeguarding in brackets and I'll explain why in a moment. I was first asked to present this by the University of Greenwich Paramedic Society students and so it's a great opportunity now to be sharing the Prezi with all of you um, as you're doing your various studies on your paramedic science degree. As you'll see from the big red blobs on the screen, there are certain topics that we're going to cover throughout this presentation. First of all, exploring what it is we're going to be talking about and why the need for it. Why do you need to do it, especially as paramedics, science students? Um, what are the particular topics that we need to look at? And then how are we going to deal with all of this when we meet uh, for our workshop? And the workshop will either be online, um, especially in these days of COVID, it's expected now that we will be meeting online, or it could be in the future that we're going to be meeting in the classroom. Okay, so that's in the what next and what you can expect to do when we actually meet. So, first of all, let's start off with the what's this and the little numbers after each of those titles are to remind me about what age I was when I wanted to tell you these stories. And this is about one of the only presentations um, that I'm ever doing that's more focused on a personal um, uh, and, or an autobiography uh, in a way uh, to, to show you how this all maps across the topics of sexuality and genders, how it maps across to us as individuals and especially as healthcare professionals. Now that photograph of me there, yes you can see look, hair, beard, the whole lot. Um, I was actually about 20 I think, so not quite 17, but I started nursing at the age of 17. Uh, in those days you could do orthopaedics or eyes from the age of 17 onwards, but that picture of me there is when I was about 20 and I was doing my general nursing. Uh, in those days it used to be called SRN, State Registered Nurse, and that's what I was doing. But a very straight hetero model looking, uh, you know, sitting there with one of my female colleagues, arm around her and all that, very straight looking. Because in those days, that was only about 10 years after male homosexuality was first decriminalised in the UK. So th there were lots of, uh, lots of men of my age and my generation who just weren't out uh, generally about our sexuality. Okay? And that's one important thing to remember. Because in the next picture now, uh, there I was around about 20 again. That's when the law changed to, uh, to, to bring in more gender equality, because up until that time, as a male student, I couldn't do things with females, with female patients. So I wasn't allowed to work on female wards. I couldn't choose to do obstetrics. Uh, there were a whole load of restrictions. Even though most of us were gay, it's ludicrous. Most of us were gay, and yet we weren't allowed to work on female wards. And then when I was 20, that's when the law changed, and I was the first first stu male student from my hospital to ask to go and work um, on an obstetrics secondment. Uh, the senior midwife at my own hospital didn't particularly like males, so she made it really difficult and in the end she refused to take me. So I had to go over to another hospital district where I was the fourth male student to do it there. But even there, it wasn't terribly welcoming. And I was given this whole list of things with 10, like 10 commandments, 10 things that as a man, I wasn't allowed to do. And one of the things on there, it said, if a woman has had an episiotomy after giving birth, I wasn't allowed to remove the sutures. If she was breastfeeding, now, I suppose you're going to find this really strange these days, but if she was breastfeeding, if she had the curtains drawn around her bed, that was the sign that she didn't want the male student to see her breastfeeding. If the co uh, curtains were wide open and everybody looking on, then yes, she didn't have a problem. And the little story I want to tell you here was when I had to work two weeks on night duty, there was only one midwife and one student. But we had two big nightingale wards to manage between the two of us. So at six o'clock in the morning, we'd have to go and wake all the women up. The midwife would go on to one ward and the student would go on to the other. Now, it's really strange because um, we used to have little uh, supermarket 
shopping basket thingies and we'd fill them with sanitary towels and breast pads and that's how we'd go and wake the women up in the morning sort of breeze through the ward doors the big old nightingale wards breeze through the doors and just wake everyone up and ask them how many sanitary towels and breast pads they'd need for the next few hours and we put these in a little crate at the bottom of their beds so I was learning all of that but one particular morning, a woman had delivered a baby the night before, didn't have a clue what to do. The baby was screaming. She was all flustered and she wanted to breastfeed, but didn't know how to. Now, remember, I was given this list of things that I wasn't allowed to do at all. So I'm trying to tell her how to express herself. I'm sort of making movements on the nipple, you know, go like this and hold the baby's face and stick the baby on. And nothing was working and she was getting more and more anxious as, as time was going by. She didn't want the curtains drawn and um, all the other patients were shouting out to me, go on, do it for her, do it for her. And I thought, well, they're my chaperones as if I needed a chaperone. That's a big issue around gender issues in healthcare. I didn't need a chaperone. They were my witnesses. Um, so I did it. I expressed her, put the baby on and the baby suckled beautifully. And about a week or so later, I was back on days and I was working on the, the labor ward when the senior a senior educator from the, the, the School of Midwifery came over to me and she had a very severe face on her. And she said to me, I hear you expressed a woman the other week. And um, really sheepishly, I said, yes, I did. And all of a sudden, this smile cracked on her face. And she said, well, congratulations. Um, apparently it worked really well. So now we can strike that from the list. So as long as women don't mind, the male students can do it. So go back to that first photo for a minute. Um, in the five years of my nurse education, for two years in orthopaedics and three years uh, for uh, general nursing, the only thing we ever did about sex uh, or uh, anything to do with sexual health was a two hour lecture on sexual infections. So imagine this now, five years of nurse education and nothing whatsoever on anything to do with sex, sexualities, sexual health, except this two hour lecture. And the tutor was going through all these slides of different sexual infections, but they were really gross. The slides were horrible. And she was showing us all these different uh, genital conditions and sexual infections, showing us these. But she wasn't flinching at all. She was really clinical and objective in the way she spoke about each of the things that she was showing us. Until one slide came up and it showed a man's hands like that. It was the back of his hands and he had second stage syphilis so he had a red rash all over the back of his hands now she'd been so dispassionate throughout on all the different things she was telling us until this slide came up and she just said oh my goodness would you look at his filthy fingernails that was the only thing that moved her nothing to do with the sexual infections at all but just that he hadn't cleaned his fingernails before somebody took a photograph of him and the final one I want to talk about is when I was uh, um, 24 years old, I left nursing. I did five years nurse education. Then I left and I spent seven years studying to become a Roman Catholic priest. Then I was eventually ordained as a priest and I worked in parish life. And um, after a few years, I left and came back into nursing. And that's when I went to work on an HIV ward at St. Mary's in Paddington. Um, I was about 32 then. But at the age of 24, so when I was studying to be a priest, because it was with the Roman Catholic Church, I was under a vow of celibacy, as we all were then. But as a younger man, before entering uh, the priestly studies, I had had sex with others. But it's at the age of 24, that's when the world first found out. On the 5th of June 1981, that's when the world found out about this new thing that was eventually labelled AIDS. OK, and when you do the HIV session with me, you will know that AIDS was the word that was used first before HIV. In fact, there was another word before then. The very first word that was used was GRID, G-R-I-D, gay related immune deficiency. It was called GRID because the very first few people in the world identified with whatever this new illness was happened to be in America. And they were all men who had had sex with other men. Um, so that's why it was it was called GRID. But within a few weeks, few months after that first uh, definition came out, that's when women were being diagnosed with it as well. So the official title was changed to AIDS, the Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome.
because it was affecting uh, females as well as males then. But the virus was only discovered in 1983, and it was only named HIV in 1985. So that's why you still find lots of people talk about the word AIDS when they should be talking HIV. But this was me, uh, I went, no, that photo, I was a bit older than 24 there, but when I was 24, that's when I was studying to be a priest, and that's when that's when the world found out about this new thing called AIDS. And because nobody knew about it, it's not like with COVID now. We, we know the virus that's causing it. We know how it's spread. We know where it's come from. And we know how to protect ourselves against this. We knew none of that back in those days in relation to HIV. And it was very much a case of um, terrible fear and panic. Because... Um, some, if you look at the histories of HIV, some people were thinking, well, let's bury our head in the sand, like those that don't want to wear masks now around COVID. So some were AIDS denialists, and they just got on as if nothing was happening at all. Others were, even went to the opposite extreme, were really, really fearful and panicky. And I can remember myself seeing all these gay men in America who were becoming terribly ill and so many were dying. And I kept thinking to myself, even though I was living under a life of, uh, of our celibacy then, I was thinking to myself, but I have had sex. So if there's an incubation period with this, you know, have I got it? Am I going to die? Am I going to be the next one to go with this? You know, so it was quite a worrying time. And when you think back to what I've just told you about my nursing days, we did nothing on sex or sexualities then. So the very fact that you're doing it now on your paramedic science course is really fantastic. Um, and especially so early on, because it's getting you to think about these things and the impact on individuals, um, maybe on yourselves, but also on the clients you work with. And that's why I wanted to show you those few photos. And why we're doing it now, as I mentioned, I was asked to do this by the Paramedic Society, and it's because I'd already done a presentation for many of the students in their first year on HIV in relation to paramedic students, and so many of them really liked that, that when they were putting up the programme for the Paramedic Society, they decided to invite me. And the focus, really, is, is, is in two different directions. Yes, it's a focus for them, it's a focus for your clients, so for you as students, as paramedics, paramedics, uh, student paramedics, uh, what do you need to know about gendered health, sexual health, sexualities? What do you need to know that's going to benefit you in the care you're giving to your clients, but also as sexual beings yourselves, hopefully some of this message will be for you as well. So the next question we need to ask ourselves is why this? Well, a couple of years ago, I was asked by an NHS trust to do a presentation for staff on genders and identities. That was the title I was given, but the conference was actually on safeguarding. So I went back to them and I said, yes, I'm more than happy to do this. I said, but can I put in the word sexualities as well, please? And an in term at the moment, an abbreviation if you want it, is S-O-G-I, sexual orient orientations and gender identities. So you'll find there are lots of studies about sexual orientations and gender identities. So I wanted the word sexualities put in, and I've used the word safeguarding in brackets because that wasn't the key focus of my presentation, um, but it was on a conference for safeguarding. So of course I had to acknowledge the impact on all of this in relation to safeguarding. Now, one of the difficulties is that whenever people talk about sexualities, so many people, I bet you, if you went out and just started asking your neighbours now, um, what do they think about sexualities, so many people are going to say, oh, well, that's about being lesbian, gay or bisexual, isn't it? Or they might even say lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender, LGBT. But stop to think about that for the moment, because the L, G and B bit, their sexual orientations... But the T, transgender, is a gender issue. And any word with trans in it comes from the Latin transire, which means to pass over something, to cross over something. So when you transition from one year to another, that's a passing over. So transgender is people um, 
assign the particular gender at birth, but then the gender they identify with isn't the same as the gender assigned at birth. Okay, so that's a gender issue, not necessarily a sexuality issue. But so many people think of this, and they say, "Oh, well, you're talking about LGBT issues," and in a way that hides the fact that heterosexual people have got a sexual orientation too. That's a really important point to make, because if people think that sexuality means everyone other than heterosexuals, then what about all the heterosexuals? They've got a sexual orientation too. Just because theirs is the biggest doesn't mean it's no less than a sexual orientation. That's a really important point, and I'll come back onto that. Because really, what we're saying is that there's, there's no simple truth about all of this. There's, there's lots of dollops of grey in between. There's not black or white. There's loads of shades of grey. Yeah, there are lots of people um, with sexuality um, issues, concerns, thoughts that are going to be very, very different from anything that comes out as any form of simple truth. So if somebody tells you well, you're either one thing or the other, don't take that as a simple truth. Um, um, answer. And the reason why I want to come back to this is to, to tell you what happened to me in class one day. At Greenwich, it was a class of maybe 250, 300 students, big, huge lecture hall at Avery Hill. And we were doing a session on sexualities. And this one male student right at the very back just shouted down to me. He said, David, look, if all these children who are lesbian and gay, well, if they realise it when they're young, why don't they just come out? Why do they live, live a lie, basically? Why don't they just come out about it there and then? And in a way, the way in which he said it was as if he was blaming them for living a lie or not, te not telling the truth, not telling the simple truth. So I said to him and the whole class, I said, look, I'm not going to answer your question. What I'm going to do is to turn it around to you all as a question, but I do not expect any of you to answer me, OK? So I said, just think about this, but do not answer out loud. So I gave them the safety of saying that. Um, and then I started asking them some questions. But these are the typical questions that are often posed to lesbian, gay and bisexual people. But heterosexual people don't get them posed. So I did that. I said, right, for all of you in the room who consider yourselves to be straight, to be heterosexual, how old were you when you first realised you were straight? And then I paused. Then I said... Who was the first person you ever told you were straight? How did they react? What did your best friend at school say? And how did your parent or parents react when you went home and told them you were straight? Now, for straight people, for heterosexuals, you never have to think like that. So even when we use terms like coming out, it's really important to ask yourselves, what are people coming out of? And what are they coming out into? Because it could be that some people are coming out of a whole family, culture, religion, society of queer hatred, homophobia, homonegativity, whatever term you want to use for it. If somebody's being brought up in a household where they only ever see these black and white images of man and woman, straight relationships, and they don't see any role models, certainly no positive role models of anything other than that. And maybe even they hear from others negativity towards people who don't fit into the heterosexual model. Then it could be that what they're coming out of is this dreadful homophobia, queer hatred, whatever term you're going to use. And what they're coming out into when they tell other people, they could be coming out into even more of that. So that's really important, especially when you're working with patients. And say, for example, in some hospitals, when a person's admitted to hospital, on the actual forms, the, 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 the nurse who, who um, clerks a person when they first go in, sometimes on those forms, because they're built on something called the activities of daily living, there may be a little box on there that just says sexuality. Now, lots of nurses don't know how to fill this in. So sometimes they might put down silly little things like um, lives at home with husband and three children or wears makeup. I've seen all of these silly things over my time. In fact, one nurse told me that she saw on one of these particular forms uh, that somebody had written in the box for sexuality over 40. Okay. 
So it shows that lots of nurses don't know what to fill in in these particular boxes. But I would suggest, even if they just showed them the form and said, look on here, it says sexuality. So is there anything about your sexual health that we might be able to help you with whilst you're in with us? At least you're opening up a discussion with people. But to start labelling individuals, and that's where the problem of this simple truth comes in, if you start labelling people, uh, that's where stigma can happen. And that's where there can be negativity towards individuals. And then, like I, like I was just saying about uh, so many people thinking that sexuality uh, literally means LGBT. But when you look at this slide, look at all the additional letters cropping up on there. There's even a Q on there. And I've actually written it as a big Q and as a little Q. So what's the difference in those Qs? What do they stand for? And maybe you know an answer to this. And it would be great for you to share that with us. But I can tell you now that normally a Q either stands for queer, because some people don't want to be identified by a particular label. Yeah, and that could even be a heterosexual person. Anyone can say, look, I don't want to be, I don't want to be labelled. I don't want to be stuck into a little box or a pigeonhole. So I'm not going to use any label for myself. And that in itself is a queer thing to do. So queer is very much a verb, a doing word. It's to queer something. As opposed to saying, oh, that person over there is a queer, which is the terminology that was used in a homophobic way when I was a child before the word gay was used uh, far more frequently. So a Q could stand for queer, or it could also stand for questioning. So that sometimes if I write it and if I put a big Q and a little Q, I'll put the big Q referring to queer and the little Q referring to questioning. Now, queer has been reclaimed by many people. They say, look, it was a word that was used offensively towards me many years ago. But if I call myself queer now, and if you call me a queer, it's not going to have a negative impact on me because I like the term. And then other words that have been reclaimed as well, that are important around sexualities. So with some of the other reclaimed words around sexualities, uh, maybe you want to ask me about those when we meet in class uh, for our workshop, OK? Ask me about the reclaimed words, because they're often words that are used in a negative way towards people, and they're very hurtful to individuals. But if that individual starts using the term themselves, it can take away the power of negativity from others. And a particular word for that power is hegemony. If it's a hegemonic power, it's an ancient Greek word that means power, but and especially in feminist texts today, it refers to a negative power over somebody. So if you say, oh, that's a negative or a hegemonic power, it's usually one over the other, very much like the black and white issue. Look how in our world, how males are usually superior to females in the ways they treat themselves with uh, laws, rights, privileges, men get more than women. But also you may say that in relation to certain ethnicities or whether a person is able-bodied or, or with a disability or different age groups. Um, there's all these different things where our world treats you, well, you're either one or you're the other. OK, and that's too much of a simple truth. So there's an article that I've uh, referred to on the Wider Spark page for you, something I wrote a couple of years ago on sexuality. And it encourages you to think, of, think about it in these four different dimensions. So when you talk about a person's sexuality, it's not just sort of one blob thing about them. OK, there are four dimensions to it. So there could, there's the person's orientation. So whether you whether you consider yourself to be straight, gay, bisexual, Look at any of these other words here, bicurious, trisexual, whatever you want to use as a term for your own orientation. But then what label do you use for that? Because supposing you're a person uh, being brought up in a family, maybe here in the UK, being brought up in a particular family or a religion or culture or part of the world where it's expected that everyone gets married to someone of the opposite sex. So, you know, boys and girls growing up, you're all expected to get married and your parents will soon want to become grandparents as well. So there's this pressure to conform. 
But supposing a person's growing up thinking, well, look, I've got to marry someone of the opposite sex and I've got to start having babies because that's what my culture or my religion expects of me. But actually, I fancy the person next door who's of the same gender as me. So when you're looking at this diagram here and it's talking about the person's orientation, but then what identity or what label do they use for it? So sometimes the identity or the label may not match up with the orientation. So the little example I've just given you now, it could be, say you've got a married couple and maybe the man considers himself to be gay, but he's had to marry a woman and have children with her. So he's doing his duty as his culture, his tradition, his religion expects of him. But he might say, but actually I'm attracted to other men. So his attractions are elsewhere, but the label he has to use, everyone just automatically assumes he's straight. In fact, in a straight world like that, they don't even need to think about it. Everyone does exactly the same. So nobody's even thinking about sexuality because everyone's treated exactly the same. So the identity, the orientation, the attractions may be different. And then the behaviours as well. So in that little example I've given you now, if you've got a man married to a woman, but supposing um, he's, uh, he's self-aware that he's gay, but he's got to be married to this woman, he might then be going off and having sex with other men. Now, if he is, is he being safe about it? Is he able to use condoms in sex or use any other forms of prevention for any sorts of sexually shared infections, including HIV? If not, if he's having to have sex and if it's really risky because they could be caught by the police or seen by somebody else and therefore it's very risky, it's quick, it's rushed. If he's not using any protection, then he's at risk. If he's at risk, the partner he's with is at risk. And then if he's at risk and he gets a sexual infection, then he's going back home. He could easily pass that on to his uh, wife as well. OK, so the orientation isn't necessarily the same as the identity. Neither is it the same as the person's attractions, nor necessarily their behaviours. Now, all of that's really important because if a person feels that they're being stigmatised, and the word stigma, again, another ancient Greek word, literally means a mark or a sign. So say, for example, oh, I'm wearing glasses. That's a stigma. That's a mark or a sign that there's something wrong with my eyes. But whenever we use the word stigma in English, it's normally now got um, negative connotations. So it's a mark or a sign of difference. Um, in a negative way. And there are three key terms to think of here. There's stigma, prejudice and discrimination. Another term, stereotype. Stereo, whether you're listening on headset and you, you've got two going on, that, mean, that, that means it's stereo. You're listening in stereo, stereophonics. So stereotype just means two or more of something. So if you say, oh, I've met a lesbian woman for the very first time. But if if you've already made up your mind, that's prejudgment. So if you were brought up being told, oh, don't bother with lesbian women because of whatever the reason. And if you carry that with you, then the first time you meet a lesbian woman, you negatively mark her with a sign because you think, oh, I've been told not to bother with you. That's prejudgment. That's prejudice. And if you act on that prejudice negatively, that's what discrimination is. Now, when you look at the current slide up here, it's talking about stigmatizing others simply because of their uh, their difference. And part of discrimination might mean that you don't even talk about this sort of person. So if somebody's never addressed, if nobody ever talks about something, does that mean that they they don't even exist? OK, that's really important because even when we come to uh, official statistics, say, for example, with epidemiology, um, especially in sexual health, lots of lesbian women have never been pregnant. Not all, but lots. Lots of lesbian women have never been pregnant. And if they've never been pregnant, obviously they've never breastfed. Now, for women who have never been pregnant, they're at higher risk of uterine cancer. And women who have never breastfed are at higher risk of breast cancer. So you could say, well, lesbians are at a higher, in a, in a higher risk uh, um, group here, for uterine 
or breast cancers. Yet when was the last time you ever saw a campaign saying to lesbians, make sure you get regular gynecological checkups? You don't. So they're invisibilized. They're hidden. But the impact that that can have on a person's own mental health and well-being, so they, no one ever talks about me. Even if you look at some of the programs on television at the moment, at the moment, even some of the soaps, um, um, Hollyoaks, Emmerdale, EastEnders, all of these have all addressed different types of issues around sexualities and orientations. And yet, certainly when I was a child, none of this would have been mentioned, or if it was, it was in very negative ways. So the impact that can have on individual as they're growing up. But the one area of this side, uh, slide, when it talks about the dynamism, that means that, uh, a dynamism is a power, it's a dynamic power for resilience and for equality, for freedom. So when people are oppressed for whatever reason in life, when people are oppressed, it can, it can push some people down. Look at all the negative things on that slide. But it can also be a dynamic power, a force for good in giving them resilience. Because... The negative side of this, when you look at the next slide now, showing how um, stigma, taboos, prejudice can be negative on individuals, yes, it can be internalised. So even when you use words like homophobia, personally, I'm not too keen on that word because phobia just means a fear of. So ask yourself, what's the difference between the word xenophobia or racism? Xenophobia literally means a fear of foreigners or a fear of foreign things. That's xenophobia. Whereas racism is normally seen as active hatred towards foreigners. Okay, so one is an irrational fear, phobia, irrational fear of, and yet a really good way of treating phobias is through cognitive behavioral therapy. But if you look through a CBT uh, textbook, you're not going to find the cure in there for things like homophobia. OK, so I would argue the word homophobia, it's, it's too nice a word. It doesn't tell you the real horrors that it is. So using a term like queer hatred um, certainly spells it out more, like the word racism does, as opposed to xenophobia. So if it's being internalised, if a person then takes on what's happening in their society, supposing a, um, a young person's growing up in a household that's really, really homophobic, and maybe the family use homophobic terms all the time, or they won't allow any positive images on the television about uh, same-sex relationships, for example. So this child's growing up in a very negative atmosphere. That can be turned in on the self. And that's, that's what we refer to as internalised homophobia. Now, sometimes... When you when you identify people who are very homophobic, who are really hateful of non heterosexual people, it could be that they themselves are lesbian, gay, or bisexual, and they're struggling with it. They've internalised it, and so now they're deflecting it out onto others. So next time you come across somebody who's really, really homophobic, just ask yourself, "Hmm, I wonder what's causing all of that." Then, okay. So that's the internalized bit. Then there's also the interpersonal. So if people are saying, well, we don't want to bother with you because you're not like the, you're not like the rest of us. So there's the interpersonal hatred going on. But it can also be part of institutions, of cultures, traditions, religions, parts of the world, languages we speak, all of those different things as well. So we have to take that on board, especially living here in this part of uh, the world where we are. Our global village is here on, on our doorstep. So people from these different parts of the world and different religions and cultures, they may be bringing the baggage of all of this with them too. And now there's a clash within uh, different cultures and even within legal systems. OK, so it's really important there. And the words overt or covert just mean if it's overt, it's out in the open. So as a child in school, when other children used to say to me, Evans, you're such a queer. Right, that's overt. If it's covert, it's hidden. So supposing, um, well, certainly when I first started nursing, and especially when I started having uh, qualified posts, when it would come to August time for people to take holidays, preference was always given to married couple, uh, straight, they were always straight in those days. Preference was given to them. And anyone that wasn't in a heterosexual marriage, you were told, well, no, look, they need it off because the children are off from school. So you singles, you don't need 
to have August off. OK, so that's covert. It's hidden. Or supposing you apply for a job and if it says, you know, family people welcome here. Well, what does the word family mean? Now, I know that's really evolving and changing today, but certainly in the past then that would have been a very loaded term. And finally, as the, the first slide shows you with low self-esteem, that it can be a really horrendous impact on somebody's self-esteem, especially in relation to protecting themselves around their sexual health and well-being. So if somebody's got low self-esteem, then chances are um, they just don't give a damn about themselves. You know, oh, do whatever you like, I just don't care, because they've got no regard for themselves. But they're also desperate for love and attention, and they'd be really frightened of being rejected. Now, I'm going to share a story with you now that's true. Um, I was working with an 18-year-old woman, and she had really long hair, combed uh, d down the centre with a parting, but her fringe fell across half of her face. So you'd only be viewing half of her face as she was talking. And she was 18. And she said to me, Dave, um, I've never had sex with a boy yet, uh, but I've started going out with this boy and, you know, chances are something might happen. But supposing he doesn't know how to put a condom on, do I need to know how to put a condom on? So I did a condom demonstration for her and she's sitting there with half of her face covered. Now, she'd been born with a cleft uh, lip and palate which had been repaired straight after birth so you wouldn't even notice it. But when she was a little child in school, the other school children, and remember some school children can be really nasty, the, the other school children emotionally crippled her, and I'm using that, per, that term intentionally, they emotionally crippled her with the awful names that they called her as a child in her school, uh, school days. So that by the time I worked with her, the way she was dealing with it was covering up her face. And when I showed her how, how a, a boy would put a condom on, she just said to me, I don't even know why I've asked you that question. With a face like mine, no one ever wants to shag me anyway. Now that's as low as she was feeling. And that's a real story. But I'm going to make this bit up now. Supposing that happened now, and supposing she's a student here at the university, and maybe this weekend, if COVID wasn't around, this weekend there's going to be a big, huge party or something. OK, so she might think, right, I've never had sex with anyone. I probably haven't even kissed much at all. So this weekend at the party, something's going to happen. And there she is with the hair over half of her face. So she goes along and she's looking around the party. She's like, oh, God, they're all ugly. But then after you've had a few drinks and the lights are out and the bars are going to close or something, even the uglies aren't quite so bad. So she might be thinking, well, OK, go on, something's going to happen. So supposing she gets flirting with a boy and they start chatting and they say they'll go back to their flat or to, to one of their, their apartments or something. And then if she says, but look, if you come back, if anything's going to happen, I only have safer sex. You're going to have to do it with a condom. Now, think of the excuses that so many boys and men may use for not wearing condoms. And it'd be worth you thinking of those. Think of the different excuses that boys and men use. But if she's got low self-esteem, then on the one hand, she just doesn't care for herself. She doesn't give a damn about herself. On the other hand, she's desperate for him to do something or other with her. And she's frightened that if she insists on condom use, he may sorry, I'm allergic to rubber. Can't do it. And he goes. She would be frightened of being rejected. So low self-esteem, if you're working with anyone with low self-esteem, I'd say it could be a real issue around sexual and gendered health. Now, so much of what I've presented to you so far may seem rather negative. Now, please, please, I don't want you to have negative attitudes about this at all. I really want to get some positive messages across here. So first of all, remember this. And this quote came back from 1983. Sex doesn't make you sick. Diseases do. In fact, infections do. So if you're protecting yourself against sexually shared infections, then you are protecting yourself uh, certainly from those. OK, so condoms, really good. Um, but there's more to sex than just condoms. Look at the health benefits showing to you here. So on this particular slide, it's just showing you a selection of different things, different aspects of life, different aspects of our health that can be um, improved because of a good, healthy sex life. 
This slide is also on the wider Spark page, so please feel free to have a look through that as well. So it's really important when we're talking about sex, don't get stuck in sex negativity, erotophobia. Think of the positives as well. Now, so when it comes to our workshop, these are some of the things that you may want to think about. Um, first of all, what are the particular situations or issues that, that maybe they have confronted you already in practice um, or you, you, you are anticipating them in practice? So what are the particular issues around sexual health? gendered health, sexual health, sexualities, what are the particular things you think may confront you within your uh, professional practice? Now, ask yourself, what do you know about those particular issues? So it could be a whole load of things. Supposing uh, you're called out because a woman's going to give birth, and when you examine her, she's had female genital cutting performed, female genital mutilation. If she's had FGC performed on her, and you think, wow, I wasn't expecting that. What do you know about it? So whatever topics you're thinking about, what do you already know? But it's important not just to consider what you know up here in your head, what are your attitudes towards this? Because again, if people are going to start telling you things, if they're going to give you their history, and as part of that history, some, some sexual stuff comes out, what are your personal attitudes towards this? And you'll see on the Spark page, I've made a little video on a particular model called the explicit model. Please work through that. Because the outside element of it, when it's looking at the different aspects of reflection, they're going to be crucial for you to explore your own attitudes. But those attitudes could also be your feelings or maybe your beliefs. And until you've met someone for the first time and not met a second person like this, a stereotype, until you've... Um, uh, work through that for the first time, then you may be dumping on them your negative attitudes. OK, and they're not there for that. That's for you to work on. It's also important not just to think of what's going on in your head, um, the, the, the clinical knowledge you have on particular things, but to explore your own skills and your habits, the, the routines with which you use for dealing with these. So when it comes to um, Dealing with sensitive issues. What happens if a person tells you something that's really confidential or something that you find terribly hard to deal with? What skills have you got? Now, a lot of those are going to be transferable skills because as paramedics, no doubt you're coming across some really sad or some tragic or some traumatic cases. So you're already building up loads of skills on dealing with these. So it's a case of looking at how you can transfer these skills across um, to help you do your job better here, especially when talking about the sensitive issues that may be involved in sexualities and genders. Now, especially with your time here at the university, uh, think about what more uh, what opportunities have got, you got to learn more about these. And if you identify that there are particular topics that you do want to cover, please get back to your module leaders or your program leaders and tell them. That's how this session has come about, because enough of the students were actually saying they wanted more on sexuality issues. OK, so. Look at what more skills you need to develop as well and how you might go about doing that. Also, you need the habit of putting them into practice. It's no good just reading a textbook on what skills you need to be a good listener if you're never going to practice being a good listener. And it's really important because you'll see on the Spark page, I end off by asking you, what difference can you make? And for me as a teacher, I'm sitting here in front of the camera talking to you all now, so I don't know how many people this message is going out to. But this is just me to you. But supposing each one of you go out and you do one positive thing to make a difference in a person's life around sexualities or genders, go and do one positive thing. Then it means this message that I'm sharing with you now will be multiplied by however many percent each one of you go out and do this. OK. And basically, let's recap over what we've done then. So it's going to be important for you to learn more, to appear, that sort of stuff. So if you think, well, look, I know nothing about stigma in relation to people who had an abortion 
or I don't know what words to use if someone's had an abortion compared to somebody having a miscarriage. Is there a difference in the words? What do I say? What do I do? What are my feelings like? All of this is important. So it's really uh, crucial for you to understand not just your knowledge, but um, explore your attitudes, your feelings, your beliefs see what skills you've got for dealing with all of this, and then make a regular habit of doing so. And that's where we come towards the end now. So what difference can you make? Certainly, I'd say the first big difference is start talking about sex. Talk about sexual health, gendered health. If you say that you want to care for your clients holistically, how can you care for them holistically if you're completely ignoring the sexual dimensions of a person's life? And that's where this model comes in here. So right in the center at the core, sexual health is important to each and every one of us. Every single one of you, sexual health is important to each one of us. But quite often when people use the word sexual health, if someone says, what do you mean by sexual health? Then someone might say, oh, that means sexual infections, HIV, abortion, contraception reproductive health. They're the classical things that people often think of in relation to the term sexual health. But it's also part of who we are. Let me give you a really good example here. When I was a Catholic priest at about the age of 30, I went round to an old lady's house. I was 30, she was 80, and her husband had just died. So I thought I was going around on a bereavement visit. And um, uh, when I got there to her house, she invited me in and she said, look, I've got something really embarrassing to tell you today. She said, it's more embarrassing because I'm an old woman and you're a young man. She said, but I need to tell you. And she touched her legs and she was wearing trousers. She said, look, I'm wearing trousers. She said, I started wearing trousers before the Second World War, before women generally did. So they either wore dresses or skirts. She said, but when I was a little girl, my parents beat me badly and they've beaten my legs so badly. I'm covered in scars and I never like anyone seeing my legs. And then she nudged me and she said, my husband was always good to me you know, in the bedroom department. So she meant to having sex. But she said, but after my first baby, my womb dropped. Now, that's a clinical, uh, um, a physiological thing to happen. A prosidentia, the womb falls forward the uterus fall forward. Uh, she said, but in 50 years, I've never spoken about it to anyone. She said, but last week, a brand new lady doctor came to work at our surgery. And that's the first person I've told in 50 years. She said, even though my husband was always good to me in the bedroom department, she said, I've never enjoyed sex. I've always suffered. It's always hurt me. Uh, but I thought it was my duty to him. And then she said, but last week when I saw the doctor, she's put something inside me. There was a little rubber ring pessary to hold her womb back in place. And she went, she was a white woman. She went bright red. And she said, Father, I've been walking around with a smile on my face all week. Do you think it's a sin? Now the poor woman was having multiple orgasms and she'd never had an orgasm in her life before. And the more we explored it, the more she thought she was betraying her husband's memory because he's no longer around to make her feel as good as this little bit of rubber up inside her. OK, so no matter how old a person is, no matter who they are in life, sexual health is crucial to each and every one of us. So it's not just the sex bits, the infections, the abortion, um, reproduction. It's not just all that side of it, but us as beings as well. But also, sometimes sexual health and gendered health can be impacted on by other conditions in life. So, for example, supposing a, supposing a person's got a learning disability, they may find that during their school years, very few people ever spoke to them about sex or safer sex. Because so many people in our society think, well, don't tell them about it and they won't go off and do it. Or supposing a person's a wheelchair user, people might think, well, how are you going to have sex so they don't talk about it? Or old people, you know, all these different things. Um, say, for example, type 1 diabetes. If a man has got type 1 diabetes, 50%, that's one in two, will have erectile dysfunction. And yet when they go to their general practice settings, as some of you may work in general practice, when they go to general practice, they may go to see the diabetes nurse specialist, and that person may be fantastic at doing their HbA1cs, doing their blood glucose, telling them about diets and this, that and the other. They may be brilliant at that. But if that nurse doesn't turn around and say, look, 
for every two men with type 1 diabetes, one in two will have a problem with erections. How is your diabetes affecting you at the moment? Unless someone has that conversation with them, it's not being addressed. And look at the, the traumatic cases you may come across. You may come across people with you know, life-threatening illnesses, um, physical changes, amputations, all that sort of stuff. Who's going to have the conversation with them about sex and sexual health and how they feel, their self-esteem? All of that is really, really important. And that's how it's um, associated and especially with mental health issues as well. Say, for example, um, if a woman is on a particular type of contraceptive pill and now she's prescribed a certain psychiatric medication, those two may not work together. The psychiatric medication may weaken the effect of her contraception and therefore she may become pregnant without wishing to be pregnant. Or supposing somebody's got bipolar when they're really manic, they may want to go out and have sex with the whole world. And then if they're going through a depressed phase, they may be really down about it. They, oh, my goodness, what have I done? I've had sex with so many people. I've put myself at risk. I've put them at risk. So even their bipolar may affect their condition. So do you see how um, the impact of other conditions in life can then have a knock-on effect to a person's gendered health and their sexual well-being? And finally, let me just mention the explicit model. So this is on the separate video on the Spark homepage. So please work through that video as well. It's a really good model. It's encouraging you to use this plicit bit in the middle with your clients. But the outside element is for you to work on. But the important thing to remember is here that it may be you that needs someone to use the plicit bit on you as well. All right. So it's really important here. Permission giving. Just think of the terminology I used when I give that example about um, um, a diabetes nurse specialist. And I said that supposing this person said, um, look, one in two men with type one diabetes will have problems with erections. How is that affecting you? Now, that's an open question. If I had said, um, is it affecting you? Then especially if somebody's embarrassed or shy, they might say, no, no, not bothering me and close their body language down. OK, so how do you get around that then if you've asked a closed question? So by asking opening questions, you are giving them permission to talk. The LI stands for limited information. So if a person says, well, look, yes, I have got particular problems you know, I don't know what to do about it. And you may not to know what to do about it, but you might say, well, look, I actually know how to access literature on this or I know where to get some leaflets for you. That's the limited information. Specific suggestions might be, well, look, um, you can probably get some great help if you go to the local sexual health clinic. OK, so you're making a specific suggestion and intensive therapy because this model was invented by um, a counsellor, a sexologist. So he used the term intensive therapy. All that means really is passing the person on to someone with more knowledge and skills than you've got. So if somebody starts talking to you about stuff that you really cannot deal with, just say to them, well, look, I'm probably out of my depth on this now, um, but I really know how to refer you on to someone that could help you uh, with your permission. Uh, can I get you an appointment? So you're referring them on to others. But all the time, look at the outside circle. So self-awareness, how do you feel about it? Are you cringing? Are you, oh, my goodness, I can't deal with this. You know, Be self-aware. How are you feeling about all of this? Because that's really important. Because if you then start sort of, grimacing your face or closing your arms or crossing your legs you're putting barriers up and maybe you're the very first person this individual has spoken to so be self-aware reflect as the whole situation's happening so reflect in practice and maybe you even need to think about it more formally afterwards so reflecting on practice review ask yourself how it went and if oh i didn't handle that one particularly well so what can you learn from that what new knowledge do you need to enable you to do better next time around and the challenging assumptions could be in your clients as well as yourselves, because they may say to you, well, look, I can't talk to you about this. Like that old lady with me, you know, look, this is really embarrassing because I'm an old lady and you're a young man. I put her at ease immediately. And I thought, look, I, 
I have been nursing for five years, so I've heard and seen lots of things. That put her uh, put her at ease so she could talk openly to me. Okay, so challenge assumptions. And here we are, finally. Um, we'll, we'll be meeting in class. In this case, we're going to be meeting online. So we'll meet in line for our workshop. Lots of issues for you to think about here. So maybe think about them, dot them down, um, write some questions or comments, or if you want to challenge me, you know, write all of these things down, keep a note of them. If you have got small study groups, maybe discuss them on, you know, on a one-to-one -one basis or in your study groups. And then when we do meet on, online, uh, some of you will want to say things individually, or you can vote on the Mentimeter and put comments on Mentimeter, so it can be completely anonymous that way. Don't worry, I'll do a whole mix throughout the work group. But you, you are welcome to speak on camera as well, or speak on your microphones, or maybe you want to nominate someone from your own um, uh, study group uh, to speak for each group on the particular topics we've covered today. But it would be great for me to hear from you what issues you've already come across or what you anticipate and whether you think there's any learning that we can help you with as you're with us at the university. Okay, so I look forward to meeting you in class. Take care and bye-bye.